welcome everyone to this uh, latest installment of the Legal Tech Institute's lecture series. Today we have a very special guest speaker. This is Dustin Sachs. He is a senior forensic consultant with D4 LLC. That's a local uh, company that specializes in consulting for uh, law firms as well as accounting firms on uh, cybersecurity and information security. Dustin focuses on cyber and digital forensics on e-discovery and on information security. He holds degrees from uh, University of Central Florida, a master's certificate in computer forensics, and he's currently working on his MBA in cybersecurity specifically. Uh, he also serves as a vice chair for the ABA Information Security Committee, amongst other um, uh, digital cybersecurity focused uh, uh, service. So without further ado, let me go ahead and introduce Dustin Sachs. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming. I know we're getting close to the holidays, so it's you know very difficult to break away for a little bit of time. But hopefully we're going to learn something interesting today, something new, something you didn't already know. Uh, we will be talking practical cybersecurity, specifically as it relates to law firms, because we're seeing some scary, alarming trends um, that I think are going to continue into the next year. Um, so we will we'll start off by talking about, well, what is cybersecurity? We all hear this term. What is it? What are some of the key terms that we encounter within cybersecurity? What are some of the common attack types? We all hear about data breaches happening on, on the news, but there are different ways in which they happen. We'll talk about some examples of some cyber incidents that have occurred recently. And then we'll talk about the practical side, some tips to mitigate attacks. And the reason I say mitigate attacks is because as much as we want to believe we can be totally immune from a cyber attack, no organization out there is going to be 100% immune. Uh, we've seen, we would expect, for example, that the US military and the US government would be immune from cyber attacks, yet we have numerous examples of cyber attacks that occur. And then, of course, we'll have time for some questions at the end. So to start off, what is cybersecurity? Well, cybersecurity is the way, is a, it refers to ways that we, per, that we do a number of things. We prevent, we detect, we respond to attacks or unauthorized access against a computer system or its information. Um, as we all know, the global cybersecurity market, the services needed, the, the investment in it is growing exponentially and is expected to continue to grow up into about $181, $182 billion um, globally by 2021. Before we really kind of get into the nitty gritty and some of the, the really more technical stuff, it's important to, to, to carve out some key terms because there's some misconception in the in in the mainstream and in in the public as to what these various terms mean so a cyber threat a cyber threat is quite simply a, a, the chance that a a chance that an attack can occur or a specific attempt to attack somebody a cyber incident is what has occurred when you've determined that Something has gone wrong, but you're not sure of the extent of, the, of, of how, bad it, how, how bad it is or what actually occurred. When we make the next leap, we actually move from a technical term to a very much now legal term, which is data breach. A data breach is actually now a very, very, a very defined, very specific legal term that varies by state or by country or by region of the world. Um, what constitutes a data breach in California may not constitute a data breach in Florida or in Texas, and what is required of you in California may be di is going to be totally different than what's required in Wisconsin. Not the next kind of level becomes what's known as a reportable event. So if we're, if we're talking about this in terms of all these are this, all reportable events are data breaches, 
All data breaches are cyber incidents. All cyber incidents are cyber threats. But going the other way is not at all ever true. You can have a data breach that has occurred where data has gotten out, but it is not a reportable event. The greatest example of this is hosp a hospital gets hit by ransomware. Um, by definition, under the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA, that is defined as a data breach. HIPAA considers it a data breach because the data has been taken possession of even if it's never left the system. However, a data, that data breach is not a reportable event if you can prove a number of things. One is there's no evidence the data actually got out. The data as it existed in the environment was encrypted and therefore even if it had gotten out and it had been decrypted from the ransomware, the d attacker would have had encrypted data. Um, or you can show some other characteristics that are laid out in the law. So a, a data breach may not necessarily be a reportable event, but every reportable event is going to start from a data breach. One of the terms that gets most missed, misused in, in traditional lay person term is hacking. Hacking actually by itself is really just manipulating something to do something else. Um, so if I, if I create a formula or I use Excel to do something it wasn't maybe initially intended to be used for by Microsoft, I've, I have by definition hacked that software. What we refer to as hacking is really cyber crime. It's where you are committing a criminal act using a computer, or where the criminal act occurs on the computer. So it's a very different term. So I will refer to, to the, the, the bad people as cyber criminals, not hackers, because a lot of IT people are, would consider themselves to be hackers because they take technology and they make it do things that we didn't intend for it to do, but that make life better. Um, somebody, whoever came up with the idea of installing wireless and technology into refrigerators, technically hacked the refrigerator. They did not commit a crime, so they're not a cyber criminal, but they are in fact a hacker. So there are a number of laws especially in the US, a number of laws that govern data breach, cybersecurity, your responsibilities. These are just a few. There are a lot that are not on here. The, the key ones I'll point out, HIPAA, uh, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, uh, General Data Protection Regulation, what we know as GDPR, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, and then the new one that's, the, the new one that I think is gonna be, really be the focus of um, thought leadership, but also a lot of focus in the next year is the CCPA, the California Privacy, Consumer Privacy Act of 2018. And we're going to talk about that here in a little bit because while it's got the name of a state in it, it applies at the current moment, it applies to a much larger population than just the state of California. There's talk and there's rumblings that in the next legislative session in California in early 2019, they might clarify some things and reword some things. So the scope may change, but as it sits right now, it's a very all-encompassing law. It is essentially California passing a federal data breach and, and consumer privacy law. So that law, that consumer, the California Consumer Privacy Act, the CCPA, goes into effect January 1st, 2020, a little over a year from now. Lays out a number of things. I'm not going to read through each one of these, but it gives consumers the ability to request a copy of their data. Businesses have to have a verification process to make sure that I am the one, that I am in fact the person who's calling, whose data is being called about. Um, Something that is a, 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 a bit of a modification, and this one's been talked a lot about, but a modification from a concept in the GDPR known as the right to be forgotten 
is that co consumers have the full right to erasure of their data um, under limited circumstances. In the, in the EU and under GDPR, you have a full right to erasure. You can, be, you can call up the phone company, you can call up the, the hospital's off hospital and say, I want you to delete all records you've got about me from, the, from, from your systems. Um, Arizona has a law like this as well, a right to be forgotten. Um, California is implementing a very similar law. Um, organizations are going to have to start disclosing who they sell their data to. And if, um, it, 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 if it, anybody hasn't been paying attention to the news over the last year, this is a direct result of Facebook. Um, sale of children's data is going to be require an express opt-in, either by the child if they're between 13 and 16, or by the parent if they're younger than that. If they're older than 16, they're considered by California to be an adult, and therefore they can do it on their own. There's no express opt-in. Um, this is something that has um, really kind of developed um, based on some work that was done in in New York. Um, and some of the protecting um, children online. Um, and it's going to lay out um, what makes a covered entity. A covered business, in this case, is going to be a for-profit entity doing $25 million or more in annual revenue and holds personal data of 50,000 people, households, or devices. And that's an important thing because California passed ver uh, about three weeks or four weeks after this law, the very first Internet of Things law against manufacturers requiring them to put cybersecurity, make cybersecurity um, a, a chief concern when they're building things like the Amazon Echo and um, all of the Alexa devices. And then, of course, the, it lays out who's go, going to be enforcing the law. It's going to be the attorney general. What are the penalties? Um, and what does it define as a um, person who's covered by this law? So what are the common attack types? You know, we hear about things like the Russians hacking into elections, or we hear about Marriott and the Chinese, or we hear about Equifax, or we hear about um, Facebook. But there are very different types of attacks and very different MOs that the attackers are using when they're attacking in certain, certainly different methodologies, which lead to certain ways that we will investigate these things. Before we talk about the attacks, the, the different attack types, it's important to understand the, the cycle, what's known as the life cycle of an attack, because regardless of the attack, all attacks are going to follow the same kind of methodology. It always starts with initial recon. You go out, you try to find out whatever you can about the organization or the person you're going to target, or you grab the list, of, the list of email addresses off the dark web that you're going to send your malware to, or you're, create, you're testing your um, payload, your pa the package you're going to send um, via email or via the internet um, to make sure it's going to work. And then you compromise your system. You do your initial compromise, which is you put your foot in the door. The minute you put your foot in the door, you've got to do something to keep yourself in the system. So the analogy I'll give to this is this is putting the piece of duct tape right over the lock on the door to make sure the door doesn't actually lock when you close it so that you can keep going out and in, out and in, out and in without having any issues. Once you get in, you're in you're, you might be in the network, in the system that you're looking to compromise, but you probably have very little, if any, access to do anything. You may have come in using an employee's account. You may have come in using you know, some router that sits way away from where you're actually trying to get to. So you've got to escalate your privileges. You've got to give yourself more permission. You've got to get that master key that lets you walk around. Once you get in, once you've got the privileges, you've got to look around and make sure that that initial recon you did matches what you now have when you're internal. And you're going to have to do further things. Now you're going to have to figure out, well, what is, where, where are these systems maybe physically located? Or where are they located within the network? How is the network organized? Now that I'm inside, 
What can I update from the recon I did initially? Then you're going to start moving through the system. And this is, you know, I, I would uh, equate this with moving through a maze. You're really moving through the maze. You may be passing through security points, checkpoints, or, or, or other things to get to where the target data that you're trying to get is stored. Um, all on computers and all from, from outside of the system or from inside the system, and we'll talk about that. But you're, all do, you're doing this all on a computer. Once you get in, once you move, you've got, to do, you've got to do what's known as maintaining your presence. You basically have to leave breadcrumbs. How did I get in? How do I get out? Where, what's the way to go in? What's the way to go out? So that I know, I know at all times, wherever I'm at in their system, how many exit points do I have? So if, it, if we were doing this in a physical sense and this room is the room where all of the sensitive data is, I need to know that how many doors there are and where does each door lead to? And if I go out this door, am I gonna encounter security? Or am I gonna encounter, how, ma how many steps am I gonna have to go up to get out of here? Because my goal is to get in and get out without being detected. Now, as I'm trying to maintain my presence and, and leave those breadcrumbs, I may realize that I, need, I really need this door to be open. So I'm gonna escalate my privileges, I'm gonna open that door, I'm gonna go back, make sure it keeps working, I'm gonna keep doing this until I achieve my mission, and then I'm gonna leave, and I'm gonna complete my mission. So now, talking about, well, what do we as the, as the good guys, as the blue team, um, and there's a concept in cybersecurity, um, and, and this, I, this derives from the military, as does the cyber kill chain, but um, the red team and the blue team, the good guys and bad guys. Um, the red team being the bad guys, blue team being the good guys. If you're on the blue team, your goal is to try to in, intercept the attack as early as you can. While they're doing recon, if I can identify that while they're poking around on the outside of my system, I know that somebody's looking at things they shouldn't be, I'm gonna know that, hey, maybe I need to shut down remote desktop because that's gonna be a problem. And through the whole process, the earlier, again, that I can insert myself as a member of the blue team, as a member of the good guys, the more, op the more options I have the more tools I have in my arsenal, and the less um, likelihood that some data is going to get out of there, uh, uh, is going to get out. The further along I get, you get in the process, the harder it's going to be to stop, the more likelihood that they've got what they need to get in and get out undetected. So there are really, there are lots of different types of attacks, but they categorize and fall into typically into one of five categories. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna kind of jump around a little bit on this because I, I wanna talk about them um, in a little bit of a different order than they are here. The first is nuisance threats. These are, you know, the kid, the kid sitting in his garage who decides, hey, you know what, I wanna, it's Matthew Broderick in War Games, trying to get in and get the video games. That's really what it is. It's, they're not really trying to do anything bad, but they're definitely going into systems they don't belong in. They may be going in there to deface, to change your website, to deface the website. Um, it's really typically where the newbies and the, the people who are learning how to be cyber criminals will start. They'll start with a nuisance thing. They'll, they'll, it's spray painting the wall more than anything. Um, Hacktivism is a, is, is a different side of it. Hacktivism is WikiLeaks type stuff, pulling out data, classified data from the military and giving it to a website to be posted for a political purpose, for some purpose. Um, it's, it's shutting down, we, we saw last year that there was a denial of service, there was an overload on the East Coast at one of the big internet service providers that shut down the webs uh, one of the websites of a lot of the big companies and it was done because they wanted to basically cripple that business for a period of time they're typically going to be more organized than the nuisance threats 
and they're usually done with some sort of political, ethical, social, moral sort of motive to it. Um, I'm trying to make the world better. It's the Occupy Wall Street. It's Anonymous, who we've heard about, the group that is out there that does all of these random hacking. Cybercrime threats, on the other hand, are going to typically be more opportunistic. They're usually going to be um, more financially based, and they're usually more short-term. They're one-off situations. Hacktivists, hacktivism threats typically form in a campaign of sorts, um, but these are going to be more, I'm trying to steal your identity. I'm trying to steal your credit card information. Most of the cyber threats that impact us, where you get that letter from Equifax or from you know, Texas Children's or whatever, are going to fall under the cybercrime threats. Insider threats, which most organizations surprisingly overlook, are one of the most deadly and dangerous in a cybersecurity setting um, attack that's out there. And not deadly from loss of life, but deadly to an organization. These are people who are trusted, who have been background checked, who are in your organization, and who know where the skeletons are buried. They know where the crown jewels are. They know where the secret formula to Coca-Cola is. They know where the client data is. They know where the client lists are. And they can get to it usually without anybody raising too many um, red flags or too many um, suspicions until it's too late. Insiders can also be innocent insiders or non-malicious insiders, and they're the one, those are the those are your friends or the people that you know that click on every link they get or open up every email that they get or open up every, or, or, or forward on every joke email that they get that ha without checking to make sure that it's something legitimate. Um, there was a and, and I used to show it in presentations. Um, I didn't have room for it today because of the just time, but there used to be, there was a couple of years ago, a very good email that was sent out that looked like it came from ADP, from payroll system, and said, there's a problem with your account. The only thing wrong with this email, grammatically perfect, logo perfect, all of the copyrights perfect, everything was perfect, the link listed something, said, had words that made it look legitimate. Except if you clicked on that link, you went to a Russian website and then that looked like ADP and entered in your information, and, th and then the Russians had it. The last one is the one that we hear about more often in the news. Um, and we can add Marriott to this one, or Starwood to this one. It's the advanced persistent threat. These are usually nation states, China, Russia, North Korea, the people that are not on our Christmas list, targeting um, an organization. It's the Sony hack. It's um, China um, getting infiltrating um, manufacturer, um, motherboard manufacturers in China that were then putting out motherboards that were sent to a company in the U.S that were then placed in places like Amazon, the Department of Defense, the military's drone operations center that had a, an extra little chip in it that gave the Chinese a backdoor into the system. Uh, Bloomberg reported about this. I wrote an article about it as well um, for my company's blog. But um, China, it, it, it's, it's usually going to be highly financed multi-billion dollar, usually for cyber warfare purposes, usually going to take some of the most egregious technologies or, or capabilities, things like manipulating people, social engineering, um, specifically targeting people with emails or what's known as spear phishing um, or espionage. So, what are some cyber examples that are out there that are, are relative to law firms? And the reason I, I, call, I call this section member, Mozak Fonseca was a law firm um, that um, had a bunch of data known as the Pentagon Papers that were out about various um, offshore 
money that world leaders and high, high well-known people had. There was a data breach, the data got out, all of this information came out. Um, it was a big embarrassment for a number of people. Some people faced the potential of criminal charges because they had been tax evading and other things. And DLA Piper was the, was, and I believe still is to date, the largest law firm data breach to occur. There were uh, something like 160,000 DLA Piper current and former employees whose information was available on the black market primarily using their LinkedIn passwords and LinkedIn credentials, which coincidentally they were then, which not surprisingly, most of the attorneys at DLA Piper were using password, the password for LinkedIn that was the same as their network password. They got into the network and took a bunch, and, and caused a bunch of trouble. Uh, it cost DLA Piper a lot of money, millions of dollars and exposure. Um, so what are the most common types of attacks more specifically affecting law firms. And some of these are really interesting because we're about to get into a period where we see these increasing. The first is W-2 scams. We see a lot of these in January, February, March time period where somebody, head of HR at an organization, law firm otherwise, will get an email that purports to be from the CEO or the managing partner that says, please send me all the W-2 information for employees over the last 12 months. Employee, seeing that it's somebody high ranking, sends the, from HR, the HR person seeing that it's somebody high ranking in the organization says, absolutely sends it on, doesn't check. The email address, the email name, the friendly name that Outlook presents is the name they expect to see, but the email behind the scenes is going to somewhere that is outside the organization you've now had an employee information data breach. Financial and accounting fraud. This is the time of the year where I get calls from accounting firms and from law firms saying, hey, uh, we were dealing with tax-related information. We went to go to the IRS and they said that there's a duplicate uh, return that's already been filed. Well, wait a second, How, how's that possible? We just got our W-2 two weeks ago. Well, what happened is somebody had gotten into the system three, four, five months ago has been sitting in the system and started filing tax returns w expecting that they could get a refund from the IRS before you file the legitimate return. Theft of confidential data. The, the reason that one of the trends that we're seeing, and we're gonna talk about it here in a minute, is that law firms are becoming a huge target because they're a central repository for a lot of organization, for multiple organizations, most confidential data. The two most often attacked and types of entities in data breach are going to be hospitals and educational institutions, colleges and universities. Why? Hospital has every piece of information they could need on you, your, your financial information, all of your personal information, all of your vital statistics. Educational institutions, colleges and universities, same thing. Law firms, the, the attackers are starting to realize that law firms, if I want to go after Sony and Marriott and Google and Netflix, that could be four separate attacks. Or I can go to the one law firm that represents all four of them and in one attack, get all four pieces of data. And, by the way, law firms typically have already have culled down or are only provided from a client the most sensitive information as it, as it pertains to the organization in the first place. So if I, wanna get, if I, if I don't wanna go into Sony's system and try to figure out where is the most sensitive data, I know, I know Sony's being sued for copyright infringement. Okay, great. Now I know where to go to find out exactly whether or not it's true or not, what items are involved, get a copy of the game, get a copy of the movie, whatever it may be. Ransomware, we see that continuing to occur on a regular basis. This is files getting locked and a, and a attacker asking for X amount of Bitcoin. Um, we've already talked about phishing. Whaling is phishing, but going after a somebody who you know is a high net worth individual. 
Um, Warren Buffett would be a victim of whaling, not fishing, because you're specifically targeting him for being a high net worth person. We see a lot more increasing as well um, mobile malware. Mobile phones are now no longer um, protected or, or not um, sources of attacks because mobile devices are beginning to replace computers a lot more. We all use our mobile devices more. It's becoming more attractive for attackers to go after mobile devices. I had somebody last week ask me, which is better, Apple or, Apple or Microsoft, in terms of Windows or, or, or Mac for your operating system? And five, six, seven, maybe even four years ago, my answer would have been, well, Apple's better than Mac because Apple doesn't have as much market share, so no one's really going after them. Um, but now, it's pretty much neck and neck now that Apple's got so much um, market share than that they, I mean, it used to be you didn't find an Apple outside of graphic designers, musicians, and uh, you know the people who drive Priuses in California. Um, the Internet of Things. As we add more devices to the net to the network of connectivity that we have, our Fitbits, our Amazon Alexas, we're adding more possibility of both inadvertent and 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 um, malicious act. Um, Amazon, as you all know, Amazon Echo has a, has a wake word. Typically you say Alexa, and then you give it some instruction. How many of you know that you can actually change that wake word to whatever you want it to be? I can create a dictionary of words like the, and I, and a, and and, and have those be the wake word and put them onto an Amazon Alexa. And now anytime you say that word, it's gonna turn back, it's gonna turn on and start recording. Your Fitbit. We've seen a lot of people now starting the, a lot of criminal cases, murders, um, wrongful death cases, that are turning on what was in the Fitbit. What, wh whether or not a voice was, was recorded on the Amazon Alexa. There was one a couple of, uh, couple about a month and a half ago now, I forget exactly where it was, but it was in the central part of the country. Uh, father, uh, uh, adult daughter who was found dead in her house. Uh, they started doing investigation, father had been there, admitted he had been there a couple hours before but that when he left, she was very much alive, she was very much okay, came back, found, hadn't heard from her, she was supposed to call, he came back, found her, and oh my God, she's dead. They looked at her Fitbit, and they saw exactly what time she died because they saw that her heart rate had spiked and then dropped. And she still had the Fitbit on her when they found her, and the Fitbit was still powered on, so any of you who are saying, well, maybe the Fitbit died, or maybe she didn't have it on. She did, in fact, have it on the entire time. They used a ring, her ring door, doorbell, her video camera doorbell connected to the internet to see that the father had shown up about 30 minutes before this surreptitious drop in heart rate and left about 10 minutes after the surreptitious drop in heart rate. They also had the door lock that showed that the door had been opened and he had used his code. Because of that, they were able to use that in, request that information and use that uh, um, to file charges against him. And invoice fraud, we still see this a lot where an invoice comes in, says, this needs to be paid, send the money to this account, you send the money to this account, and it ends up being a malicious actor. Talking back at some of those stats that we were talking about, more, in, in the last year, more than one quarter of law firms with more than 500 attorneys admitted that they had had some type of security incident or data breach. Approximately 40% of those firms had reported that they had significant business downtime and loss of billable hours. Um, approximately 25% of those had, pay, had to pay hefty fees 
to, to fix the problems, and about one, one in six law firms reported that they lost important information and files that they can't recover. So what are some examples? Well, and why are law firms atta attacked? One, they house valuable confidential data. In a 2016 incident, an attacker hit a well-known merger and acquisition firm with uh, a little over 100,000 separate different little types of attacks over three months and earned a little over $4 million selling the stolen information. Law firms are also good, at good targets because they've got, a lot of, they've got money. Um, a Toronto firm saw a six-figure sum stolen from a trust account. Somebody sent a Trojan in, which if you have studied the Trojan War is exactly what it sounds like, a virus that comes in, masquerading is a good file, and then the bad stuff jumps out, um, and it swiped people's banking passwords. Um, another firm had just settled a wage and hours um, case and was, as I said, was just saying, an invoice style fraud was duped into sending half a million the half a million dollar settlement to a scammer because they got an email that looked like it was coming from the case administrator. That's an invoice fraud. And unfortunately, of all of the industries out there, save for oil and gas, and I say this all the time in Houston, and I'm waiting for, and I, and, and I said it last week in the energy corridor, and I was surprised that um, Shell, BP, none of those guys um, picked me off in the parking lot with, uh, you know, with, with anything, but they're not prepared. Law firms are typically not prepared. Um, according to a 2017 um, cybersecurity report called the Scorecard, 62% of law firms do not have a dedicated information security professional. Less than a third of law firms have a formal cybersecurity training program and only 41% have formal documented cybersecurity policies. This, by the way, last year, this was the DLA Piper. This is what you came into when you went into DC, the DC office in DLA Piper. There was a whiteboard. This was how they got their, their news out to their employees. Attention DLA Piper, DLA employees. All network services are down, underlined. Do not turn on your computers. Please re remove all laptops from docking stations and keep turned off. Um, no exceptions. And this is in the lobby of a major DC law firm, so it's going to make news, and, or it's going to make somebody putting it up on Twitter. So what are some tips? What are, let's get to the practical side of things. What are some tips to mitigate attacks? I always like to share this because this is the most, in my opinion, practical tool out there for anybody to look at and understand what they need to be doing in order to um, have a, a strong cybersecurity system. This is what's known as the uh, Center for Internet Security's Critical Security Controls. It operates on the 80-20 principle, or a modification of the 80-20 principle. There are 20 items listed here. If you do just the first five, and the first five are knowing, having an inventory of unauthorized and authorized devices, software, having secure configurations on your hardware and software, doing continuous vulnerability assessments, so continually checking to see what your weaknesses are and fixing them, and controlling administrative privileges, you do just those five, you reduce your likelihood of being victimized by an attack by somewhere in the neighborhood of about 85%. You do all 20, it's somewhere in the 90 to 93% range according to the research that they have done. And it gets more, more important and more technical and more expensive as you go through, but this is a practical these are, if I'm ever asked, give me a list of the five things I should be doing or the three things I should be doing in order to um, help, help lower my chance of being attacked, I give one, two, and three off of the critical security controls. So what does that look like in reality, though, and in more practice? First thing is, and in 2018, after almost 30 years with computers in everyday life, 
we still have to tell people about using a strong password. And a strong password, by many accounts, is at least 12 characters. Um, because no matter how strong an eight character password is, it can typically now, with the tools that are out there, be cracked within about two hours. A strong 12 character password, so upper lowercase, um, special characters, numbers and letters, not a common word, um, can, typically takes about 17 years, at least, to crack. Don't use the same password everywhere. This used to be even more serious. Southwest Airlines was notorious for this, and I always use them as an example because I've been flying Southwest for most of my adult life. It used to be that if you did remember my password on the Southwest website, it would mask with dots your password. But if you scrolled over that with the mouse and then hit Control C, it copied it and went into a text, into Notepad and pasted it in there, it would show you the password. Um, the problem that we run into is people use the same password on multiple websites. DLA Piper is an example. Um, Yahoo, how many people? How many people who were affected by the Yahoo breach had passwords that they had been using everywhere else for years that now they have to go back and fix? Definitely, at a minimum, banking, financial, healthcare, your most sensitive data should not have the same password as your email. Change your passwords regularly. It's good to have a password, but you've got to change it regularly. You've got to assume that every 90 days or so, your password has been made ex exposed in some way, shape, or form, whether it's been reported or not. This one is funny, I know, but in my 13 years of doing this, I've seen this more times than I care to admit to. Do not have a file named passwords on your computer. I had a, a case with an individual who had a file called passwords.doc on the desktop of his computer. Not only did he have the, pa the username and password for every website that he ever logged into, he had a nice detailed explanation of what each site was using. And oh, by the way, what uh, it, it ended up that this file, uh, and this is not completely related to it, but I like to share it because it's a funny story anyways, um, had, a, had this file and had detailed instructions to his secretary of what to do if anyone had ever found his computer or started to investigate his computer. That he had emailed this file to her and said, this is what I'm doing with this website. I'm selling stuff on eBay I shouldn't be doing. Please make sure to go in and disable my account. Here are the steps for how to do it. Another, te another technique that people still to this day use, do not have your passwords on a sticky note. Don't put them on your monitor. It's actually now a term known as sunflowering when you see post-it notes all around. Don't put it under your keyboard and don't put it in your top right drawer. I, I, I include this one because when I was in graduate school in Orlando in 2005 doing this, um, we actually had an exercise. One of our first exercises is they set up a mock office. In a, in a real office in, in the university. And we had a contest and it was, we were told the password that we needed to get into the computer was available to us in this environment. That we, we needed, that we could find it and that sitting in the chair at the desk like this, you should not have to get up to get to the password. And the contest, we, we made a game out of it there may or may not have been alcohol that was promised to the winner, but the game was to see who could find it the fastest. The first place you're going to look is that drawer to the right, the drawer in the middle, and under the keyboard. Those are the three places people put it. Change the defaults. This is one that I've been fighting with my father and my father-in-law about for about the last 10 years. It, when you buy a router at the store, it comes with a default password. When you get a modem from AT&T, they may give you a, what they say is a unique password, but they've got, an, they've got a copy of that information. 
change the defaults because I can go online and I can actually Google what is the default admin password for this model of Linksys router and I can get in. Your laptop should be treated like it is something that could result in your demise if it is lost. Um, it should be protected with whole disk encryption. Uh, stolen and lost laptops are still the leading cause of data breaches. Backup media should be encrypted. Uh, if you're using an online backup service, make sure that they're encrypting your data because you're sending it across the internet and you don't know who's paying attention. Be sure that employees of the backup vendor don't have access to your decryption keys. Most of the vendors will say, oh, but we need to have the keys in case that we need to help you with disaster recovery. And they will actually now, you can say to them, no, give us the keys. We'll hold on to the, the key you need to decrypt the data. And if you need it, we'll give it to you. Thumb drives, USB drives, they shouldn't really be used anymore because they're just a pain in the butt and they're easy to lose and they're easy to walk out of, but they sh uh, company with, um, they should be encrypted as well. Um, and encryption should be enabled as much as possible on wireless devices. If you've got a router having an open internet connection or a router, or, 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 or a, a router that has very weak encryption, <coughs> is going to, or, or a bad pass or weak password, is going to open you up to um, exposure. Another project, another uh, experiment we used to do, we, we did in graduate school was we got in the car, one guy sitting in the driver's seat, one guy sitting in the passenger seat, and we drove through a neighborhood in, t in Orlando and saw how many houses could you get down the street staying on the internet, and how far did it take before you finally hit a house that didn't have, that had a secure internet connection and you were now no longer able to be on the internet. And it's alarming. Last couple things, these are more general, but keeping your servers in a locked rack or a locked closet, locked room. Um, I just did an assess, a cybersecurity assessment for an organization here in town who puts their marketing people in the same room with all of their uh, patient data in a server that Anybody can walk up and open. If I can open up the server, I can plug in a USB drive or a, I can, pl I can pl pull a drive out and I can do damage to your system just by simply walking in. Wireless networks, again, should be set up with proper security. Make sure all critical patches are applied. We saw the danger of this last summer with, in the UK with the WannaCry incident where hospitals that were still running Windows XP three years after Microsoft stopped supporting it, um, found out that they were exposed. Um, Microsoft issues patches every month. Your virus scan software issues patches all the time. Having those patches is, is very important to making sure that your systems are going to be protected against the newest attacks. To that point, if software is no longer being supported, you should no longer be using it. Put your security in, in jeopardy. The minute they stop supporting it, it means they're not doing anything to make sure it's secure, and it's only gonna take the attacker, and if an attacker figures out a way to get in, no one's gonna stop them. And another question that should be asked is controlling access. Does the secretary really need to have access to QuickBooks. Does the secretary really need to know where the secret formula to Coca-Cola is? Social media, this is becoming an increasingly dangerous area of um, cybersecurity uh, because many of the apps we use on our phone will ask us to log, will say, hey, I'm gonna make login easy. Just use Facebook, just use Google. Use one of those logins. Um, and, and I'll connect and I'll use the, the information you've already put into the Facebook app on your phone and I'll automatically log you into this app. Every time you do that, you're giving that app access to your phone and to information on your phone. And that may open you up to being attacked by cyber criminals. Um, 
it's important for an organization to have a social media and incident response policy. Having a policy that says, this is what you're allowed to say about the company on social media. This is what we want you to do. This is what we don't want you to do. Here's what you're allowed to do. Um, from a brand standpoint, here's what you're allowed to talk about. Oh, by the way, remember that while you can talk about generally the type of work you do, you need to make sure you're, you're uh, uh, maintaining the proper level of confidentiality. Um, make sure your state ethics rules allow for as well. Um, lawyers, uh, there's a lot of the state bars are starting to have ethical rules that, behind what they're allowing people to do on social media. Um, let your employees training, 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 training. Letting employees know how to use social media as safely as possible and if there's an incident, what they need to do. We all take for granted social media. We all feel very detached from uh, reality when we do it. That's why kids these days are bully using, turning to social media to bully because it's anonymous I can, or it's, or it's, you know, it's a, a, an arm's length away. I, I don't have to look at you when I do it. Same thing for cyber criminals. Last couple things, most smartphones have some data on their phone, uh, on the device. So opening a client document on your phone, even to read it off of an email, you've now put that uh, a, a record of that or, a, or the document itself on your device. Uh, making sure you have a pin code more than just the fingerprint or more than just the, the, you know, the, the swipe to open. Um, again, using cloud providers just like using online backup, you want to make sure that you're checking into their security. Some have better than others. When you're done with, a, with, with something, copiers, printers, faxes, old computers, make sure you're de destroying them securely. Don't just toss them in the trash because that could have data still on it. There are a lot of free programs out there that you can use to securely wipe data from a device. And going back to just to, to just like using the um, encrypt, using encryption and security on your home wireless, be very weary about using wireless hotspots at Starbucks or others because one you don't know what you don't necessarily know what information they're tracking about you. Two, anybody else who's logged in at that same time could, can, could figure out how to get to your computer and compromise it. And three, they're usually set up with really crappy passwords. I'm not going to run through all of these uh, um, one by one again because they're all variations of making sure your screen, you have a screensaver that automatically logs people out after a certain amount of inactivity. Don't share your username and password with anybody, even your secretary. There should be a, a setup for them to be able to get in without needing that. When you terminate an employee, I'm dealing with this right now actually, make sure you kill their ID, that you get rid of their ID, and that you cut off any access. The, the example I had, I have a case I'm working right now, it's a theft of trade secrets case, where while I was looking at the data last night, I found that they had a large amount of one Microsoft OneDrive cloud data on their system. My very first email last night at about 11 o'clock last night was to the attorney to say, have they shut off access to OneDrive? Because while they may have shut off access to that person's system and their remote access, that OneDrive data is out on the cloud. They could be pulling it down to a home computer. And look at whether or not you need cyber insurance. A lot of current business insurance does not on its own cover data breaches. And data breaches and security incidents can be very expensive. With that, if there are any other questions, yes? Um, what kind of precautions do you uh, recommend us to take when we use the uh, public services in the law library and the Houston public, lab, the, uh, Houston public library services? Again, I'm not saying you shouldn't ever use you know, wireless hotspots and that you shouldn't, you should never, that there's never a valid reason to do it. But make sure you know what you're doing. Make sure you're being cognizant of what am I doing when I'm sitting on that network. So what I always do, for example, I, I happen to, to work remotely when I want to. So I, the other day, for example, I, I spent the day working at a Panera Bread near my house. I got on their Wi-Fi, but the minute I got on their Wi-Fi, I then signed into my VPN client. Because now I'm on my company's network 
under my company's security, under their protocol, just using somebody else's internet. So making, but, but making sure that if I'm on an airport Wi-Fi, that I'm not, maybe not sending in my emails right then. Maybe I'm drafting them. Maybe I'm working on documents. Maybe I'm downloading stuff to my computer. But I'm also being careful about, am I, do I really need to be downloading this right now or should I do it? It's just adding a little bit of forethought to what am I doing and a little bit of, of, of critical thinking to what am I doing when I'm on that network. Any other questions? Yes. Just out of curiosity, with all these breaches that have been occurring, particularly these big law firms and such, I'm wondering if their malpractice insurance covers that or is there an exclusion? Um, as far as I know, and I'm not an insurance, I'm not intimately familiar, I know enough about the cyber insurance to be dangerous, most of the malpractice does not cover cyber breaches like that, computer incidents, um, so, because it's not, unless it gets to a point where it's truly egregious, but a lot of the malpractice does not, which is why the cyber insurance guys are coming out. AIG is the number one um, provider of cyber insurance, for example. Yes? Just a curiosity. When data is compromised, for example, the Marriott case, was that data just available for taking or was it actually taken? It depends. Um, and the answer that consumers will usually get is there is a potential that your data was exposed. And usually that is some crafty wording that comes both from the lawyer and the forensic examiner. Um, I had an incident where we weren't able to show that data had left, but we also weren't able to show that data hadn't left. And because of that, we had to say to people, we don't know that you were in fact compromised, but we're letting you know, we're doing our, our part. I, I will commend this organization. They did their part. They notified every single employee and patient that they may have been compromised and that they needed to look at their credit reports and make sure that they, they were monitoring activity. And if they saw something that didn't look right, then they could call and they would be offered credit monitoring services because some most of the laws require some credit monitoring service, but organizations are starting to find Equifax did this real, really poorly, but basically organizations are finding that they can get people to either opt in or opt out of that, that um, credit monitoring because it's very expensive and you have to typically do it for a course of about a year. Um, and it, it's $100, $200 per person, and if you think of a 40,000 person breach, that becomes real money real quick. If you think of Marriott or Facebook, 50 million times $200 per person, that's a lot of money. Um, maybe not for Facebook, but for, for the average person. So the answer is, if they know for a fact it was taken, they probably won't tell you that it was. Though it will always, so it, it really depends and it's really not something that's usually made public until, until or unless regulators get involved. Yes? Um, most of the data breaches that I've heard in the news seems to be for personal information. Um, are you aware of like, I mean, have a fair number been for trade secrets? Or have those been yeah, I mean, there, there are, the trade secrets ones usually don't get publicized as much, because if I'm an organization, if I'm Sony, the, uh, Sony's, I mean, Sony's a bad example because it did become public, but there are a lot of organizations that get breached that, for trade secrets, that don't want anybody to know because they don't want to know that they're vulnerable or they don't want their competitor going out and finding the data that was compromised because all that data is now in the wind. It's available and it's usually available for very cheap on you know any number of different websites and you can find people who can go out and get that data for you. Um, there are services out there that scan the dark web that you can run search terms against and you can pull back all of the information that's out there. And there's nothing stopping your competitor from doing that, so you're not gonna make it publicly known necessarily. The other thing is a lot of the trade secrets data breaches are an insider, and therefore they're not, they're not usually notifiable events. They're not usually, they don't right now meet the qualifications for the laws 
to need to be not to need to notify people, um, or they're not they're still not viewed as data breaches. We think we hear data breach, we think of some external person sitting in a, you know a basement in Russia doing it, but we have data breaches. We have people who walk out of companies with data all day long, every day, that are technically data breaches. I had a, a theft of trade secrets case last year I worked on. It was employees of a company who had been let go, who didn't disclose to the employer that they had computers at their house that, um, that, were, that had people's personal information on it. Now, we were able to show that that data never actually was used for anything, so it wasn't a data breach, so it doesn't get reported, but it was still a insider threat, insider theft or trade secrets matter, and these people faced criminal charges for it. Are you able to track that down? Oh, oh yeah, we were able to show, well, I mean, they, they admitted that they had these computers, and then we were able to show what they did with the computers and what they did with the data on the computers to be able to show that they didn't actually ever send it anywhere. They, ne it just, they just happened to have, they just kept these computers and didn't tell anybody about them. They may have intended to use them at some point, and that's where you get into the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. I've had a lot of cases where ex-employee, Florida does this a lot, they'll charge ex-employees of organizations under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act because the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act has a provision in it that says that, that basically calls computer fraud and abuse the ac accessing or having access to a system that you are not authorized to have access to. So an ex-employee of an organization before they're terminated they're not violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act the minute that they are terminated, they're technically in violation of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act at that point. So anything that anybody does on the computer can be tracked down? Exactly. Okay. Most of it. There are ways to certainly cover your tracks, but that, that in and of itself can be damaging sometimes yeah. as well. Anything else? Yes? I'm told that old printers retain the data showing every image that was ever produced on that printer. Is that accurate? And if so, what needs to be done to uh, erase that? Certain printers, not I wouldn't classify them as older per se, but the multifunction copier, scanner, fax, printer that most organizations have in their offices these days have hard drives in them or actually have computer operating systems running. Every time you send a, every time you send, and this has been the case for pretty much as long as computers have been around, any time you send a, um, a job to the printer to be printed, what's created is known as a spool file. It's basically a file that, that, has, that contains the data in it or some element of the data that goes from your computer to the printer and says, please print this. Here's the information you need to print it. So in the older days, five, 10, 15 years ago, you could get those print spool files and you could find out what was being printed, what file was actually being printed, and the date you could get to the data that actually was being printed. Um, or you could see the name of a file that was being printed and then go find that file. Now you get the actual file gets sent to that printer and you can go to the printer and pull off, pull that hard drive and pull things that have been printed three, four, five years ago that are no longer on people's computers. So the answer is what do you, what do you need to, what do you do when you're done with them? You, you make sure, first of all, if you've got a vendor that you're renting them from, that they destroy the hard drive that's inside of it or that they give you a copy of the, they give you the hard drive out of the system when they take that printer at the end of its lease or that they allow you to overwrite that hard drive and send that, give that hard drive back to them. But you want to make sure that you're not and this is the same thing we've seen. I've seen people, and I've read stories where people will take their computer. There, there was somebody who took a computer a couple of years ago, took it to Best Buy to be disposed of, to be repaired. They replaced the hard drive. They pulled the hard drive out of the system. They didn't wipe the hard drive. They took that hard drive and put it into somebody else's computer, fixed it, put it into somebody else's computer, and that person went and ran some recovery because they lost a picture file and found hundreds of files that were not theirs, that had been recovered as part of the data recovery. There have been even more egregious ones where the person plugged it in, went in, went in and loaded it into the computer and found all of the files not deleted. 
So you, you want to make sure whenever you're disposing of a hard drive or of a, a device that you're making sure that you either reset it to factory defaults and if it's got a hard drive in it that you pull the hard drive out of it. So that's the risk that we run by printing off of the, of the uh, li uh, uh, law library, the public library. Yeah. Public library, public library activity is not private. If I go search a website on the public library's web uh, computer, you get that banner that says anything you do can be tracked, and we, we have the right to know anything you do. And that's why when you when you check out time on a computer, you're now tying yourself to the, any activity that takes place on that computer while you're there. So that's why you should be locking your computer when you walk away from it. Well, thank you all for coming. I appreciate uh, your participating and, and uh, listening. Thank you. thank you. And that's all there is to it. For more learning opportunities like this, including online tutorials and in-person training sessions, visit the Harris County Law Library's Legal Tech Institute website at www.harriscountylawlibrary.org tech.